So if anybody uh, has a strong desire to be on YouTube, we can pan the camera. Um, I think the ninth and 10th graders want to be, so at some point we'll pan the camera over there and you guys could maybe like wave or something. It's your one, one minute to be famous. Um, okay, so we've all this build up. I hope I can deliver something. <laughs> so, um, the saints are one of my favorite topics. Uh, my brother just visited his son and his son, who's a freshman in high school. And they stayed with me at the rectory in Randolph. And um, so they stayed in my room because the downstairs room is kind of needs some work. So I put him in my room. And my brother, when he walked in my room, he's like, oh my gosh, you have a lot of holy things in here. I said, well, those are all my peeps. They're protecting me, you know, all my, my saints. So I do. I like, uh, I like images of saints. Um, some I've gotten places I've traveled. Um, some I've gotten from different people or churches I've been at. Um, so I'm one of those people that the saints I like change. Um, because there's so many of them. For our younger um, students here, there are saints that were your age and even younger who are canonized saints. Um, there are saints who um, came from all different walks of life. I'll never forget, I was in uh, Pompeii. Pompeii is outside of Italy, outside of Rome. Um, and I was at the, the uh, pontifical shrine of the Rosary, the Most Holy Rosary. And they had a saint there. His name is Vice Blessed, Bartolo Longo. And he was kind of a cool looking guy. He had a big beard and he was this kind of skinny looking guy and they had pictures of him. Um, he had a massive conversion through the power of the rosary. Uh, he was actually into the occult. And it was through the intercession of Mary that he got out of that. And then he became a very powerful proponent of the rosary. So. Saints have been into evil. They've been in tremendous sin, addiction. Uh, they've been in all kinds of professions. So, you know, probably farmers, you know, St. Isidore. Uh, he's a good patron saint. But for if you want to be a doctor, if you want to be a lawyer, uh, an Indian chief, whatever, you know, you want to grow up to be or you are, there is a saint for you. Uh, there's saints for different kinds of illnesses, um, family struggles, and unemployment. And so for me, that's, that's why I say I can't land on one saint, because life changes. You know, I might say I want to be taller. Is there a saint for getting taller? I don't know. So whatever it might be for you, I mean, that's why the saint talk has to be personal. I mean, I can give you, I'll give you the stuff. But my hope is that you walk away from here and you actually find, if you don't have, a saint that you can connect with. Um, I, I love Blessed Pier Giorgio Frassati. He was a young man, died at 24. He used to go hiking in the mountains. He was an outdoor guy. So if you like the outdoors, maybe you're into hunting or fishing, um, he would be a great saint for you. I think why I bring this up is most of us, when I was little, uh, at least initially, until I began to maybe understand more, the saints were people like that had a shiny thing around their head, and they like lived in a church 24 hours a day, and they you know were constantly praying until their knees bled, and you know that kind of crazy image we have about holiness. Like we think it's something so far away from our experience that I'm never going to be a saint. And I have nothing in common with the saints. And so, um, so we're going to look at that at, at your table. And maybe we'll just start. Uh, again, part of my hope is not so much that, you know, I sit here and you listen to me and, and you go home. But that you begin to think about it. So let's do that right away. Our first question for your table, and if you're by yourself, jump on another table that has a couple people. Your first question, and we're going to give you about five minutes to talk, is, um, first of all, what is a saint? And again, if you're at home, this would be for your family. So, what is a saint? 
Um, and do I think of myself as a saint or a potential saint? And if I don't, why not? Okay, so what is a saint? Um, do I think of myself as becoming a saint? And if I don't, why not? All right, so just take about five minutes at your table and discuss. There's definitely a lot of conversation. Um, did anybody, uh, does anybody want to share anything that your table talked about? Or, um, about the saints or, yes? Thank you. Oh, a saint with a lowercase s, everyone in heaven, and a saint with capital S is ones that are canonized. Thank you. Good. Okay. Perfect. Can they hear that? Did they hear that? So she said, saint lowercase is everyone in heaven, canonized saint uh, would be some of the saints we have up here. Okay. And then, does everybody here want to be a saint? Good. All that means is that you're going to get to heaven. You know, you want to be in heaven. So, okay, so we're going to talk about a few things. Um, um, first, you know, the difference maybe between someone who is in heaven. And I regularly pray to, especially for me, I pray to priests that I knew who have passed away because they were friends or mentors. And I believe they're in heaven. Um, mainly because they know me. And so, uh, and I really feel their prayers for me. You know, at different times, I've really felt um, that they hear and from heaven answer that prayer. And so, um, so a saint might be for you a grandparent um, who's passed away. It might be somebody who uh, helped you grow as a person, especially in your faith, somebody you look up to. And so we can pray to those who have died. Uh, we can also pray for them because, of course, we don't know they're in heaven. We hope they're in heaven. And that's really the difference between a canonized saint. And so uh, up here we have some relics. Um, you guys have all, I'm sure, heard about the recently acquired relic of Mother St. Teresa of Calcutta. And so... Um, so canonized saints go through a process um, of several steps. I had the, the blessing when I was uh, at St. Bonaventure, I lived with Father Andy Rosa, who's the vocations director for the Archdiocese now. And he was the chaplain at SCOTUS Catholic High School. And um, Father Rosa was working on, is working on, he's part of the team that is working on the process of canonization for Father Flanagan. Do you guys know who Father Flanagan is? He started... Boys Town. Boys Town. Okay. And so Father Rosa had in his room um, journals, original source material that he was, he had to read through all these things, letters, and, and because he has a, a, a licentiate in theology, he was asked to be uh, on this team. And so he was looking over to make sure there was nothing in the writing um, that would, would be off in some way about the Catholic faith. Because again, part of, of just taking that first step um, is that the church pours over everything you've said and done. And so that was one of the things he was doing the entire year I lived with him, he was working on that. So, and then they finally, toward the end of the year, they opened the case for him, so they, they the archbishop opened it officially. They sent that uh, initial paperwork into Rome. So, so there's a, a, a real process. It takes time um, to become a canonized saint. The main thing the church is looking for is again your way of life, everything you've you've taught or written, um, and miracles. Now, I think the odd thing is the church isn't saying did miracles happen when you were alive so you know did you walk on water did you multiply food I mean that's good um, but really what they're looking for is after you've died people who have prayed to you have they received a miraculous intervention 
Typically, their medical um, medical healings that can't be explained scientifically. And they go through a whole process. There's several doctors on uh, teams that go through these supposed miracles and they'll, they'll look at all the evidence um, before that miracle is approved. And so, for example, uh, with St. John Paul II, they probably received, I don't know, let's call it 5,000 miracles after his death that were sent into the Vatican. So they're going to go through all those. And they really need two. The first one is when that saint becomes blessed. Um, so the first. So I was at the beatification of Mother Teresa of Calcutta in Rome. And, um, and so there had been uh, one miracle, and the Pope declares her blessed. So that's a public ceremony. Um, and then the second miracle, the Pope declares that person a saint, meaning, you know, we're sure they're in heaven. And I've been at two canonizations, one of Jose Maria Scriva in Rome, and the other just recently of the parents of the little flower. And I'll never forget, I was with uh, St. John Paul II and miraculously had the opportunity to be up in the front near the altar. I actually wasn't planning to be at the canonization. Uh, myself and, and a friend of mine, we met this couple at a pizza restaurant. And I was a newly ordained priest, and they said, here, you take our tickets. We've been to canonizations. We're from Michigan. Um, apparently, they were somewhat important for Michigan because you show your ticket, and when I kept showing the ticket, they just kept sending us up closer, and eventually, I sat next to three priests who lived and worked with Jose Maria Escriba. So, um, but it, the coolest thing was seeing the cardinal, who is the, the head of um, the cause of the saints, he reads a request to the Holy Father, to St. John Paul II, he read, asking him, and it was just, you could just feel it in the air. I mean, it was, you know, it was a beautiful day anyway, but um, when St. John Paul II declared him a saint, um, you really feel that, that heaven really um, is behind that declaration. And so, and so it's a neat thing if you ever get a chance to either see one or, or be there for one. Um, so then someone is canonized, and then in the, in the case of um, many of the saints, there's relics. And relics fall into three kinds. So um, I gave everybody at the first meeting what is a third-class relic. It was um, on the back of the holy card of uh, Padre Pio was a piece of cloth that had been touched to his body or to his casket. Um, a second class relic is something that they use. So if, um, I don't know, you know, Pope John Paul II used this or more, more normally it would be like his zucchetto or something he said mass with. Um, but it's something that they, they use directly, especially in their ministry. Um, and then a first class relic is a part of their body. Uh, so, and I know that seems kind of weird, but um, again, it's, it's a way to, uh, to venerate that we do in our normal life. You know, how many people uh, maybe you don't understand the theology of uh, funeral and burial keep the remains of their family member on a shelf. Or, you know, we keep the, you know, the recipe book that grandma had and we don't just photocopy it. We want the book. I want to have that book and, you know, read that book. So we do this all the time. Um, but this is doing it for someone who we believe is in heaven. Okay, so um, do we pray to the saints and then why? I think the, the first thing, one of the misunderstandings, we have a statue of St. Joseph up here. Um, for those who are not of the Catholic faith, they come into a Catholic church and they see, as we have here, pictures and statues. And of course, um, you know, the misunderstanding is they think we're worshiping saints. They see candles or incense in, in front of this statue and it's a false idol, they think graven image. Um, 
what I would say is, is think of it more like, um, you know, Martin Luther King Jr., who was a, a very good man, helped in the uh, forwarding of civil rights in our country. We named streets after him. Uh, we have, um, you know, statues of famous people. Um, we put them in a courtyard and we put benches around there. And, you know, uh, we have parades in honor of, of those people. So it's not because we worship Martin Luther King Jr. We don't, you know, say um, you're a god. We just say you're an inspiring person. You're so inspiring. I'm gonna. We're gonna name a school after you, or a street, or we're gonna, you know, maybe have a beautiful painting or something you wrote, and we're gonna frame it. It's just a way to remember that person and what they did to inspire us. But we also can pray to the saints. Um, we believe that those who died and are with the Lord are still present with us in spirit. And so, um, so the Lord encourages us to you know, pray for each other, pray for one another, bear each other's burdens. And who better to do that than those who are with God directly? Because of course they can uh, you know, talk to God uh, as, as we're talking here and, and make their case to God for us. And so, so I, again, I encourage you to, uh, to pray to the saints, venerate the relics of the saints uh, as a way to ask for, um, for their prayers. I think sometimes there's a little bit of misunderstanding about heaven. So, um, and I'd probably be guilty of this myself, you know, of, of saying right away somebody's in heaven who died. Uh, the reality is, is um, we don't know that. So is everyone a saint? No. Uh, a saint is someone in heaven. And we as Catholic Christians believe some people don't, um, sorry, make it to, uh, some people don't make it to heaven, or they choose hell. Uh, some people are in a place of purification, so they're not yet in heaven, they're in purgatory. And so, um, so again, I think, I encourage you if someone dies to, especially to pray for them, as well as to pray uh, to them. Um, does anybody have questions, or have you ever had an experience yourself with the saints that you want to share? I can, I can share more, um, but I just want to give, maybe think about that. So when did my personal love for the saints, and maybe this would be a way as a family to grow? Um, again, my mom and dad weren't born on fire Catholics. They kind of went through a conversion experience in their early married life. Um, but they, uh, some of the things they did is they took us on pilgrimages. I didn't know it was a pilgrimage at the time. I thought it was just a long, boring car ride. You know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> with a bunch of people in my family packed into a van. Uh, but we went to uh, some places that I visited. Um, the Shrine of the North American Martyrs, which is in upstate New York. Um, my grandparents lived in upstate New York, so we went up there. And um, we walked around this, this shrine, and you could see the cabins where the Jesuits had lived. And I, I'll never forget, they talked about how they were tortured. I mean, I, I'm a little kid, you know, I was a lot younger than you guys. And they were talking about, you know, that the native people bit their fingers off, you know, and, and they, um, they tortured them really to death because they thought they were bringing uh, you know, bad luck to their tribe and they thought they were in superstition. You know, they didn't understand who the Jesuits were. Um, first they tried to kind of beat them out of the camp and when they wouldn't go, they ended up killing them in a, in a pretty terrifying way. But, but I guess it, to me, it just all of a sudden it just became real. It was like, they lived here. They died here. And I was just a little kid. Another, it might have been around the same time, we went up to Montreal to, at the time, Blessed Andre Bessette, uh, who was, um, I mean, talk about it, he was an ordinary guy. He answered the door. That was his religious job. He was a porter, and he worked as a sacristan. So saints don't do necessarily, you know, amazing jobs. Very simple guy. 
Um, but through the intercession of St. Joseph, who he would turn to people to pray to St. Joseph, many healings. And so we go into this huge church and covering the wall. And if you've ever traveled maybe to Europe or something, you've seen this kind of thing. So picture this wall, but it's four times higher. And it was coated with crutches. And, you know, um, I don't know what the right word is, those things people use when they, and braces. And, and these were people who had been cured, and they left their stuff there. So in other words, they came with braces, they came with crutches, they came with something because of their infirmity. And they were healed through the intercession of St. Joseph and St. Andre Bisset. And then they left their, the sign of their healing there. And again, as a little kid, you're just like, what? Like, that's a lot of crutches. It was just overwhelming. Like, it's a huge church to begin with, but then to see a wall full of crutches. Why do I say that? Because it's important that you take ownership of sharing these kind of opportunities with your family. That's when this stuff comes alive. Maybe, you know, uh, the relics, they actually had the relics of um, St. Maria Goretti were in the United States maybe a year ago. Uh, they were on tour. <laughs> so a 12-year-old, guys, 12-year-old died 100 years ago. She was on tour. And, you know, thousands of people came to see her even though she was dead. She's an incorruptible. Another sign that she was a saint is her body looks like she just died yesterday. So incorruptibles, uh, I've seen several different incorruptibles. And you walk up and it's, it almost, at first it almost looks like they're a doll or something. And then it'll say the saint's name. Usually they're under an altar dedicated to them. But it's a sign that they were chosen by God, that they lived this holy life. Their body hasn't decayed. Um, St. Kateri, who was a... Uh, in the same area as the North American Martyrs in Quebec, in upstate New York. She had, um, was it smallpox? Yeah. She had had smallpox, and her face was like a giant bunch of craters, you know. I mean, just, just disfigured from smallpox. When she died, at the moment she died, the people who were gathered around said her skin cleared the moment she died. So again, these are, these are real things that happened. And they should inspire us to seek out these kind of friends. Maybe as a family, maybe each person in the family has their own saint. And then to have something of them. I, I, I'm a firm believer in, I'm a very visual person, so I, I like statues, I like pictures. Um, and if you, if you want to get really radical and get a relic, I can take you to eBay right now. If you go out to eBay, I have gotten, I have rescued at least five, five relics off eBay. Sadly, you know, people put another, eBay says you can't sell human remains, so what they do is they say, we're selling you the gold container, and you just get the remains with it. Isn't that sad? So, but if you want a, a first class relic, sometimes the best way to know if, they, if they're first class is They'll have the paperwork, so we have the paperwork for Mother Teresa from Rome. And then the relic on the back has two uh, pieces of thread and then a wax seal. So that, you know, if you were to ever try to tamper with that, you would break the wax seal or break the thread. If that's broken or tampered with, then, you know, you, you don't know for sure if that relic is the real thing. It's a real relic, so. But again, um, if I had all the money in the world, I'd just buy them all. Because <laughs> to me, they're, they're meant to be reverenced. Uh, one of the things I said this at Mass, that the missionaries of charity asked us is, tell us, so you guys, you know, if you, if you experience a miracle when you pray to Mother Teresa, let me know. If it's, you know, I didn't study for a test and suddenly I knew algebra. Okay, it was just infused into my head. Let me know. So, because again, the expectation is that the saints want to pray for us. Uh, they want, 
They want us to be happy and to know God. That's, and they, once someone knows the Lord, their burning desire is for more souls. And especially people who are furthest away. So pick your friend who, they don't believe in God, you know, they don't buy into any of this religion stuff. You turn them over to a saint. You pray for them. And you just watch. That saint will just come alive in their life. Might be little steps or stages. But the saints love to pray. They love to pray for us. Because the greatest joy, and it's the joy of Jesus, is that everybody comes to heaven. I think we're going to be shocked. You know, there's a, there's a joke that uh, uh, the, these people are being, they're new recruits into heaven, you know, and they're being led down this long hallway. And, uh, and St. Peter says, shh. So they, they walk down this long hallway and they pass this door. And he says, shh. So they walk down the long, at the end of the hallway, somebody says, okay, I've got to ask what's behind the door. And he says, well, that's where all the Catholics are and they think they're the only ones here. We don't want to ruin it for them, so we don't tell them. <laughs> so we'll be shocked, you know? I mean, what did Jesus say? You know, everybody, all the Jews who thought, well, we're the chosen people. Right, we're, the, we're the, you know, you, yeah, you were, you are, but are you living that way? You know, Jesus hung out with prostitutes and tax collectors and public sinners. Right, and he said, you know, uh, they're going to be getting into heaven before you because they know they need me. And again, this is what I'm talking about, this hunger for the, the help and the prayers of the saints. So, um, so again, I think that more than, you know, if you want to read more about a particular saint, there's some, um, it's catholic.org, I believe. They have the saint of the day. And so if you go out there, they'll actually have it in writing. If you're lazy like me, you can sit in your prayer chair and you can just hit the audio. You just be like, today's saint is, and this is what they did. And it's great. You know, you can learn about that saint. Um, but again, especially to, to grow in that friendship with them. So, all right. Thank you, everybody.